Tonight's guest, um, you don't know him, but you've probably been angered by him <laughs> when our bridges have been closed for repairs, and it's one lane traffic, <laughs> or they're painting, or they're doing something there with all this stuff all around the bridge. On the other hand, you might be very uh, pleased to meet this gentleman, because he has kept these bridges open and usable, and allows us to get from one place to another without getting on a ferry, which we'll see in one of these pictures. Uh, it would take us a day and a half to get up to Newport, and another day and a half to get back. So, uh, Bernard, Bernie, C Covino, uh, has been doing this kind of work for a better part of his career. Uh, he actually worked with Garner, um, Albany, in Albany, uh, for the latter part of Garner's career. And uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. We, especially here on the Central Coast, are very reliant on those bridges, no matter which direction we go. And uh, without them, it'd be old pioneer days. So please welcome Bernie Cavino.
But here we are uh, uh, at the end of the uh, Cape Creek Bridge after doing some work on some of our uh, research on the bridge. Uh, here I am uh, uh, on the uh, substructure of the uh, Cape Creek Bridge. There's a little article that they published in the Albany Democrat Herald. And uh, I'm checking some of the uh, metal samples that we had, uh, metal samples here that we had uh, exposed underneath of the uh, bridge. And, and as a result of all that work, two of us, myself, and Steve Kramer got asked to uh, uh, put together a corrosion handbook for the American Society for Metals. And uh, this is like the Bible for corrosion scientists. And uh, we were very pleased. To, not only did we take a one volume, the previous version was one volume, and we created three volumes. So <laughs> we, did, we did a lot of blood extra. It's, it's, it's state of the art right now. Um, I'm going to read uh, this part of the talk, if you don't mind. There's a lot of details of it, and I want, to, want you to, uh, to get all of them. Uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation is spending about $10 million per year to replace, rehabilitate, and protect the co its coastal bridges. Uh, many of these bridges are considered historic and represent the engineering leadership of one person, Condi B. McCullough. I want to give you some sense of the engineering influences on McCullough and his influence on later generation of bridge engineers. I want you to be aware of the remarkable fact that many of these bridges were built during the Depression. I want you to know that there were few roads to the coast and bridge construction materials other than false work were mainly brought in by barge, ship, and train. A talk about Oregon's historic coastal bridges must include Condi B. McCullough the acclaimed Oregon Bridge engineer responsible for their construction. <coughs> John D. McCullough was a developer of innovative bridge designs, a lifelong student of, energy, of engineering theory, an educator and mentor of young engineers, and an author of scholarly books on bridges and engineering law. Tony was born in the Dakota Territory in 1887. He was raised near Fort Dodge, Iowa, where his family moved in the early 1890s. This was a time when the Good Road Movement was gaining a foothold on public attention. The Good Roads Movement had an impact on public transportation in the early 20th century. And this is similar to the impact that the interstate highway system had in the late 20th century. The Good Roads Movement was the catalyst for better bridges. It was a movement driven not by tourism, but by the need to get crops and products to market and by the spread of rural coastal service. The roads that existed at the time were often inadequate for these tasks. Patented bridges were sold out of catalogs to those in county or city government who, who had the money to buy one. These bridges were often poorly designed and constructed and few survived for any length of time. A more analytical approach to engineering, growing public resources, and an interest by emerging state highway commissions in producing more enduring and efficient roads led to modern developments such as, as this. Sam Hill, the father of the Columbia Gorge Highway, is quoted at the time as saying, good roads were the key to civilization. And if he had thought again about that, he would say, good roads and good bridges were the key to civilization. Question. What is the circle? Oh, that's the old road. That's a car, a truck up uh, following the old, old oh. road before the Columbia Coast Highway was uh, built. <coughs> Condi McCullough graduated from Iowa State College in 1910 with a degree in civil engineering. His first job was with Marsh Engineering in Des Moines, Iowa. James Marsh is best remembered for his five reinforced concrete rainbow arch bridges in Iowa and Kansas. A casual glance would suggest that this bridge was on the Oregon coast. It is not. It is in Kansas. A rainbow, a rainbow arch bridge built in 1928. 
The young McCullough's work in Marsh Engineering influenced his later bridge design. This is the Big Creek Bridge. It was a tied arch design, a stronger design than the Rainbow Arch, and one seen in many of McCullough's bridges. McCullough left Marsh Engineering after one year and went to work for the Iowa State Highway Commission. In 1914, James Marsh was sued for patent infringement by Daniel Luton over the, his patent on the Luton Arch. The state of Iowa came to Marsh's defense. McCullough spent almost three years re researching arch bridge designs as part of this defense. One bridge design from France particularly impressed him, the Pont de Gare, built in 18 BC. <laughs> we can see the influence of this design on the Cape Creek Bridge, built in 1932. And this is one of McCullough's most unique and attractive arch designs. McCullough left Iowa to become professor of civil engineering at Oregon Agricultural College, later Oregon State University, in 1916. In 1919, he left to become bridge engineer at the Oregon State Highway Commission, later Oregon DOT, and he remained so until 1946. His guiding principle was, a bridge should be functional, economical, and aesthetically pleasing. He did not consider the short-lived high-maintenance bridges being built elsewhere as economical. Now we're going to leave McCullough in the Oregon coast for a brief detour that will show McCullough's influence on a later generation of bridge engineers. On the left is Dexter Smith. Dexter was a professor of civil engineering at OSU with, with McCullough and later went to work for him at ODOT. On the right, on the right is Ray Archibald. Ray was a student of theirs, captain of the OSU football team, and along with three other classmates graduating in civil engineering in 1919, also went to work for McCullough. Dexter Smith submitted a design for the Tacoma Narrow Bridge in 1939. It was not accepted. The accepted design self-destructed at Galloping Gertie after three months' service in 1940. When the new bridge was built in 1950, they finally chose Dexter's design. After leaving ODOT, Ray Archibald went to work on the Alaska Highway, designing and building many of the bridges. This is the bridge over the Peace River, north of Dawson Creek in British Columbia. This bridge is not unlike the suspension bridges Condi McCullough and Ray Archibald built together on the Pan American Highway in the period 1935 to 1937 as part of President Roosevelt's good neighbor policy. Ray Archibald went on to help design and build the four mile long US Route 50 crossing over the Chesapeake Bay, built in 1952 and shown here in a rare night shot. And this is one of my favorite bridges because it would take us from my home in Baltimore to the, uh, or, uh, the Atlantic Coast beaches. Eastern Shore. Eastern Shore, right? Ocean City. Call your attention to this little design right here. Uh, I'll make reference to that uh, a little bit later. The Chesapeake Bay Bridge was expanded in 1973 to include a westbound span. Today, the two bridges carry over 20 million cars a year. An interesting fact, uh, and they all seem to be there on Friday, I go, we, we go to Eastern Shore. <laughs> An interesting fact for fans of Oregon bridges, on the east end of the first Bay Bridge, again, this, this little detail right here, there's an almost identical copy of the steel cantilever span from the Coos Bay Bridge, built under the guidance of Ray Archibald in Oregon 15 years earlier. And I'll have some pictures, I'll have some pictures a little bit later that show that cantilever span on the Coos Bay Bridge for you. Our detour is over. We're back in the 1930s. Connie McCullough and his talented crew have built over 200 bridges in central and eastern Oregon and along the Columbia River Gorge. Here he is receiving an honorary degree from Oregon State University. 
In the 1920s, the Roosevelt Military Highway along the Oregon coast was dusty ruts in the summer, muddy ruts in the winter, broken by open water crossings of bays and rivers. Here we have elephants and camels crossing on a ferry boat at Gold Beach on the Rogue River. <laughs> the coastal communities were vigorously campaigning for funds to build bridges. One new bridge a year was the hope. By the 1930s, the highway had become, in the eyes of, of the promoters, the Oregon Coast Highway. Nostalgia was all that remained for the ferry service after the 1930s, as bridge construction ended the era of ferry boats. The Oregon Motorist, billed as Oregon's only travel magazine, published a special coastal bridge issue and suggested that each reader send a copy to a friend in another state. No doubt, imploring, come visit, but don't stay. <laughs> We will now look at six of McCullough's coastal bridges. These are the bridges at Gold Beach, Coos Bay, Cape Creek, Walport, Newport, and Depot Bay. <coughs> this is the Coos Bay Bridge under construction. Here we see the timber false work used in forming the arches and the deck and the steel cantilevers truss span over the shipping channel. The Coos Bay Bridge was completed in 1936, then rededicated to Condi B. McCullough in 1947, a year after his death. It was McCullough's largest bridge. As an example of Condi's attention to aesthetic details, he curved the lower cord of the steel truss, this is right here, to echo the shape of the adjacent concrete <coughs> arches. And, and here's that detail that was uh, copied in the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, the original Chesapeake Bay Bridge. The McCullough Bridge essentially completed the Oregon Coast Highway. Eric Deloney, chief of the Historic American Engineering Record, said that Condi McCullough built 10 major bridges on the Oregon Coast Highway, no two alike, the space of eight years during the height of the depression is nothing short of amazing. He further states the Oregon Coast Highway has one of the great, perhaps unequal, collections of bridges in the United States. This is the Cape Creek Bridge viewed looking west. As we noted earlier, it is modeled after the ancient Pont de Garde aqueduct in France. There are no side views of this bridge from the highway, and few motorists see it unless they stop at the Devil's Elbow State Park on the west side of the bridge. In the distance, we see the Hesita Head Lighthouse, one of the most photographed views on the Oregon coast. <coughs> Here we have a view looking south towards the Cape Creek Tunnel. Here's the bridge in a morning fog, viewed from Hesita Head. In the afternoon, the fog will evaporate, leaving a haze of salt. This salt depend, deposits on the bridge, migrating into the concrete and initiating corrosion of the reinforcing bar. This corrosion is the cause of bridge deterioration on coastal bridges today, and the reason ODOT is working hard to find ways to preserve these bridges. This is the Sideslaw River Bridge. It is one of Con and McCullough's more accessible bridges and is perfectly designed for its setting. It is a double bascule drawbridge. It has a double bascule, um, two, two parts of the bridge open up. It is wonderful Art Deco features typical of McCullough's bridges and, and a, a uh, indicator of McCullough bridges everywhere as you see the decorative elements on the bridge. The bridge in, in Albany where I live is, has decorative elements at the McCullough Bridge and in uh, Sio, uh, no, Jefferson the Bridge in, in the Jefferson is another one. These features added little to the cost of the bridge but greatly enhanced their appearance. Timber towns 
wanted the coastal bridges to be constructed of wood. Funding much of the construction, the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads wanted concrete. When folks saw how much timber was used in the false work, they quit objecting. <laughs> The Alsea Bay Bridge was a classic McCullough Bridge. It had all the characteristics McCullough details, and it, it was a delight to the eye. It is no longer with us. Rebar corrosion eventually took its toll. Here's an unusual view of the replacement bridge alongside of the original bridge. While we may mourn the loss of the original bridge, ODOT did a nice job designing the replacement bridge. It has clean lines that evoke the memory of the original McCullough Bridge. This is the, uh, a recent view of the Depot Bay Bridge. The original bridge was designed and built by McCullough in 1927. A little known fact is that it is actually two bridges. The widening bridge was added in 1940 and is visible in the support structure. Original bridge widening bridge. <clears throat> More than 20 tons of zinc have been thermal sprayed onto this support structure. Nice gray color you see in this picture. The zinc is used as part of a cathodic protection system for the rebar to prevent future chloride induced corrosion damage to the bridge. I'll talk about that in a little more detail later. The Rogue River Bridge is dedicated to Isaac Patterson, the governor of Oregon from 1927 to 1929. It has been declared a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark by the American Society of Civil Engineers. <coughs> As with many McCullough Bridges, he experimented with design principles looking for more efficient economical ways of building bridges while retaining aesthetic appeal. The Rogue River Bridge was the first in the U.S. to use the Fresnade method of decentering and stress control. That's a mouthful, but basically it means um, find, uh, finding ways to build it with thinner columns so that you can make the bridge lighter. When the Rogue River was dedicated in 1932, the Salem, Oregon statesman said, this bridge will stand for centuries we trust, in token of the vision and courage of the people of this generation. Well, here we are about 70 years later, well, maybe 80 years later, and far short of a century. This is, there's chemistry going on in, in these historic bridge, coastal bridges. Salt is breaking down the passive film on the black arm, re reinforcing bar, initiating corrosion, cracking the concrete, and weakening the structure. That leads into a short primer on corrosion. Fundamentals of corrosion. Corrosion is a fairly complex subject like most uh, in the world today. Uh, lots of different types. So I'm not going to talk about hardly any of these. Um, mainly I'm going to confine myself to a few ideas of why corrosion happens and uh, what it does and how it happens in uh, to rebar in stainless steel, I mean, in, in how it happens to rebar in concrete. So what is corrosion? Well, this is an interesting shot of uh, Joe Flynn, remember Joe, uh, Mikhail's Navy? Corrosion of socks, I don't know, maybe that was something they were worried about during the World War II, I guess. Anyway, uh, corrosion. Uh, navigating a sea of corrosion for the 21st century. Uh, I rusted in Oregon, and I love rust. I have a bumper sticker that says, uh, Oregonians are rustless names. Uh, I love them all. <laughs> but corrosion is really a, it's the degradation of a material, any material, due to its reaction with its environment. Now, why does that happen? Well. Especially with metals, uh, remember that the metals 
metals uh, come from ore, and how do we get the metal out of the ore? We put a lot of energy into that, that ore to get the metal out. Um, that makes the energy to the uh, ore, the metal, in a higher energy state than, uh, than the ore. Um, so you know, things at higher energy states in this universe want to go back to a lower energy state. They want to become more stable. So metals are, are unstable. Most metals are unstable. Gold is pretty stable, but most iron is unstable. They all want to go back to their oxides or sulfides or carbon or whatever. The, the, they want to go back to be like the ore. That's the natural way of things. What are some synonyms? Well, we have bad corrosion and we, we have good corrosion. Bad corrosion is called corrosion or rusting or wear or oxidation among others. Good corrosion happens in batteries, electrochemical machining. So a use, you know, corrosion can be put to good use. Corrosion costs the country quite a bit. The estimate, this estimate here says it costs one trillion dollars every year for corrosion. Um, this number comes from a 1998 study that showed that the, uh, the direct cost, the direct costs of corrosion. Okay, so these are costs. Direct costs are costs that owners of a facility or of a, a bridge or a water tower or something that they would pay. Okay, those are direct costs. Two hundred seventy-six billion dollars. Two hundred seventy-six billion dollars for indirect costs. Now these are costs that you and I pay. We pay them by, uh, you know, when the bridge is closed and we, we're late for work or, or uh, it, you know, we're, you have a problem at work and something corrodes and falls apart and you, so you, you can't work, you've lost time, uh, things like that. Those are indirect costs. And if you add in an inflation factor from 1998 to 2013, you come up with a cost of corrosion of, of one trillion dollars. You know, it's one seventeenth of our deficit. Our debt, right? it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, and and the estimates are that you can save between ten and forty percent of that number by using the best corrosion techniques available. If everyone would use the best corrosion techniques available, we could save as much as forty billion dollars a year. And these are the kind of categories that where you can see the biggest ones are. Uh, drinking water systems, uh, defense, uh, motor vehicles. Motor vehicles rust on the coast. <laughs> um, electrical utilities, gas distribution, water distribution, and then bridges are in there, railroads, uh, all sorts of uh, costs. Now, <coughs> <clears throat> corrosion reactions are electrochemical in nature. And what, what does that mean? That means that you have chemical reactions that occur between a metal and a liquid. Usually a liquid. Okay? Metal and liquid in which, in which there are electrons which are exchanged. And, and there's always two reactions. There's always uh, an anodic reaction and a cathodic reaction. And if I could eliminate one or the other, I can stop corrosion. Okay, so it's it's neat that there are two two reactions, and I'll show you a schematic of that. So here we have metal <coughs> sitting in water, for example, and here's the anodic reaction. Okay, so it's the metal the metal starts dissolving. Okay, the cathodic reaction then involves usually oxygen or water, and it reduces it. And those two reactions have to occur at the same rate. Um, because electrons from this reaction, this electron here, go, goes through the metal and, get, and makes itself available for this cathodic reaction. One can't go faster than the other. And, and, and that's, uh, that's important because, if, like I said previously, if we can, if we can say reduce this reaction, we can slow down this reaction. And that's basically the, uh, 
the idea of cathodic protection that I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking about, so, which is what's used on the bridges. Um, this is an interesting diagram that we use in study of corrosion. It's called a Corbet diagram. It's a stability diagram. It's it's a uh, the x-axis here is pH, and I think most of you know pH is an indication of whether something is acid or basic. So the, the lower the number, the more acid it is. The higher the number, the more basic it is. Uh, the interesting thing about this is um, when you put rebar in concrete, the pH here is about 12 and a half to 13. There's no corrosion occurring. This is a perfect environment. You can't get much better than rebar and concrete. pH of 13, uh, keep out other stuff, and, and, you, and the rebar is going to last forever. Wow, forever. Whereas if you, if, you, uh, if, if you make it more acidic here, you get into an area here where there's corrosion. You can see there's corrosion here, and there's protect, passivation or protection over here. So if the pH drops, then you get it, you get corrosion. Uh, now this is a, a schematic of a piece of rebar in concrete, and there are certain things that are impacting. This is the outside of the concrete. For example, the, uh, the bridge deck or a bridge uh, structure. And there are things that hit it all the time. You know, there's water, there's uh, particulate matter that uh, comes from dust, in agriculture, there's a carbon dioxide, one of the bad actors with concrete. Um, and then there's, there's salt. I've, I've shown it as chloride ion. So if, I'm not going to talk about carbon dioxide, but this actually causes the pH of the concrete to become more acidic and causes corrosion if, if it can penetrate deep enough. This breaks down the uh, the passive film on the, on the uh, uh, rebar and makes it start corroding. And that's the, pro that's the problem here on the coast. Salt. You got salt. You got a plentiful supply of salt out in the ocean. And you get it in rain. And you get it in salt fogs and mists and uh, all, all sorts of like uh, Other states might get it from the icing salts. And they have the same problem. Now, so this is, a, this is a graph that shows distance from the surface of the concrete. This is the surface of the concrete here, distance from the surface, and chloride ion content. And we're looking at two different time periods, two years and four years. And here's the rebar down here at about 40 millimeters from the, from the surface. Okay, and here we have a corrosion threshold level, which is about 1.2 to 1.4 uh, percent of salt. Now when, when, when this, uh, at two years you can see that it, the level of salt has not reached the corrosion threshold level at the rebar. At four years, it's just starting to. If we would have gone six years, it would have, it would have been um, definitely uh, well beyond the corrosion threshold at the rebar. And this is what it takes to um, to start the rebar corroding. And this is the problem with the bridges uh, on the Oregon coast. Salt lands on the surface, sits there, and diffuses in through the concrete. Um, now concrete is a, 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 uh, concrete is a, uh, a very complex structure. It has lots of water in it. So there are bound water and there's free water. And the, the salt can easily diffuse through, those, uh, through the water and through the concrete. So let's think about what that does. Here we have a piece of rebar. In this case, we have a, an epoxy coating on, on the rebar. Um, in fact, that's the case, and this is concrete. This is what they put in the, uh, this is what they put in the, uh, the new Alcee Bay Bridge, epoxy coated rebar. Uh, none of the other bridges have that at this point. Um, So the salt gets in and it starts corroding the rebar here. And here's, here's the rust. 
you see it's penetrated the, uh, the epoxy coating, but it doesn't matter if that coating's there or not. Um, epoxy coatings are good, but they have holes in them. They're allowed a certain number of holes per foot. Uh, anyway, you can see here that the, uh, um, the rust has started. Now, I'm going to tell you that it takes only one one-thousandth of an inch of metal to be corroded. One one-thousandth of an inch, one mil, we, we call it mil, but the, be, to start cracking the concrete, okay? And here you can see it's a crack starting. One one-thousandth of an inch, so that's not very much. Um, and the reason for that is that the, uh, uh, the iron oxide occupies one and a half to three times the volume of the steel itself. So, you know, think about it. If you have a box totally full of iron, put water in it and rust starts, what's going to happen when the, you know, it's going to explode the box, rupture the box. And that's what happens. It ruptures the concrete. And we get things like this. It's a cross-section of steel, rust, concrete and you can see the crack propagating through. Another view, uh, this is a section of a bridge that we, uh, we did a post-mortem on, and uh, you can see the, the rusty rebar, the cracking, and the concrete. This is the bottom of the uh, uh, Big Creek Bridge. Uh, clearly, uh, when it gets this bad, it's almost <coughs> too late to save the bridge. But uh, in fact, that's what happened with the LC Bay Bridge, and uh, and they had to do that. They had to blow it up, and uh, unfortunately, this was at a time when uh, ODOT did not have a strategy in, in line for uh, saving bridges, but I, I believe the people of Oregon spoke up, especially the people of the Oregon Coast spoke up and said, we do not want to lose any more of our bridges, our, our beautiful bridges. So, while we would love to be able to do this, um, we, we really can't, except the, with video. Uh, it's bad. But there are ways that we can, that we and, and ODOT can do things to prevent that from happening in the future. And, that, and they are doing that right now, uh, all along the coast. Part two. So what are they doing to, what is ODOT doing, and what have we done, we being uh, me and my colleagues at uh, NETL, what have, we, uh, what have we done? I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, and a little bit about cathodic protection. It'll get a little bit technical, but not too bad, I hope. Existing bridges, what, what they're doing right now is rehabilitating them and installing cathodic protection. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what you see on many of the bridges up and down the coast. New bridges, some possibilities that we propose are what's called cathodic prevention, which is a, a lower level of cathodic protection, and the use of stainless steel rebar. Thinking a little bit out of the box with today's economy. How much does stainless steel rebar cost? Or? That's a great question, and I'm going to answer that a little bit later on in the talk, okay? You'll see that it's not that bad. So, back in 1991, ODOT had to make the decision, do we replace the Aquinnah Bay Bridge for $50 million, or do we rehabilitate and install CP for $15 million? And, and these are the direct costs of corrosion. Okay, so right here, ODOT chose this one, and they saved $35 million. Uh, of direct costs due to corrosion. If more states, more uh, municipalities would, would think along these lines, then we could save more money 
of the cost of corrosion. How do they rehabilitate them? First of all, they they find corrosion hotspots. They do this by surveying it with a reading the potential of the rebar. Then when they find a hot spot, they excavate the concrete, they repair, cut out the bad parts of rebar and weld in new ones or replace whole sections of rebar. Then because we're going to be doing cathodic protection, which is an electrical, electrochemical technique and it involves electricity, you have to make sure that all the rebar is electrically connected. So they have to uh, take and all the rebar, make sure it's welded at the proper points and it's all connected together. Then they spray uh, shotcrete to replace the concrete. And uh, while they're doing that, they, they always maintain a rigid, the original bridge form and design. And that was yeah, your concern there about the Cape Creek Bridge, whether they would uh, retain the same form and design of the, uh, of the uh, railing. So here we see shotcrete being applied um, to the Quinta Bay Bridge. And uh, you'll see uh, a form being used here to maintain the, uh, the uh, arches, correct, the correct arches, and, and following the old, uh, old lines. Um, they, they did a very, very thorough job of keeping the Quinta Bay Bridge and all the bridges that they've done uh, true to Condi McCullough's original design. Design. Excuse me. Could you explain what shotcrete is? Shotcrete is just a uh, uh, concrete that can be sprayed. So it's a very fluid form of concrete. Um, it's uh, it's not necessarily there for its strength, but to, it's there to cover the rebar. The the bulk of the bridge is still there, maintaining strength, and they re replace the uh, rebar. Uh, and without the rebar, of course, the bridge would fall down because concrete is not that strong by itself. So, um, here's the, the uh, schematic I showed you before where the metal is dissolving here and the, and the anodic reaction and the cathodic reaction is uh, over can, here. Can I ask a question? Yes. This is related, but in the 30s there was a whole design of, and the phrase is re re restructured concrete or who knows the phrase, from the architecture that was done in the 30s. And I always thought, I guess I thought the opposite. Are those, are those buildings being held up by the steel enforcements and the concrete's there simply for artwork and preventing this corruption, corrosion? You could take rebar and expand it out to be a metal building. Sure, it would be a lot more expensive and it would be harder to protect. So the concrete is there. It does have some strength and compression. It, it's when you pull on it or, or bend it like this, which is called uh, tensile, um, that concrete is not very strong, but if you press on it like this, yeah. so the bridges are designed so that the concrete is always under compression, which is its strongest state, and the rebar is there to help maintain that strength. So is this whole principle of, of building, when was it invented? What's that? This whole principle of using of rebar and concrete? That's a good question. I, I do know that the, uh, the Romans were the first to use concrete in their aqueducts, like the uh, Pont de Garde that I showed there, but they didn't use it in structure, in, in building. They used it uh, to seal the, uh, the, the duct so that they didn't lose water. Yeah. Um, when did this take place? It's, it's probably been hundreds of years, I would think. Yeah, probably a couple hundred years. Yeah, the use of cathodic protection now is much, much more recent. Uh, I'll show you the uh, picture of the, uh, the first cathodic protection system. Well, actually, cathodic protection was actually discovered by Sir Humphrey Davy, who uh, applied it to British warships and, uh, and put um, um, zinc, um, chunks of metal on the uh, on the hull to protect the brass hulls. So, but applied to bridges, it's fairly fairly new. I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, is, is cathodic protection the 
Is the same thing as a sacrificial animal? Yes, very similar. It's similar to uh, 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 zinc coated steel. Um, yeah. So anyway, if, if we can, if we can. Uh, um, reduce this and, and, and make the reaction primarily this cathodic reaction, then we have done our job and we can keep the rebar from corroding. And that's what cathodic protection is. And I'm, I'm going to try to get a little bit technical here and uh, explain how that works. Um, the way we study corrosion in the laboratory, we, we put two pieces of metal in a solution of something, water for example. We hook up a amp ammeter to measure current and a voltmeter to measure voltage and we have a variable power supply here to apply a potential. And we scan that potential through a series of potentials like, like this. Um, this is a um, log of the absolute value of current density here. Okay, so you can't take the log of a negative number, it's the absolute value of it. Um, this is a, you know, the, the voltage would be scanned in this direction. Um, this is the negative, we can study the cathodic reaction here and the anodic reaction here. The two parts that, that, that account for corrosion. And right here, where it goes through a saddle point, it changes, changes sign. It goes from a negative current to a positive current. Right here, the, where Corrosion, where the anodic reaction equals a cathodic reaction, where corrosion is, is occurring right here. I'm going to blow that up just a little bit with a, uh, going to use what's called an Evans diagram. And uh, here, here we have the anodic reaction. Again, metal is going to some metal ion. Iron is going to ferrous ion or ferric ion. Uh, oxygen is going to go to OH or something like that. This is the cathodic reaction. And here's the corrosion where I, I showed you that saddle point. Um, right here, if you left it there, the steel is going to corrode in the concrete because of the chlorine. But what cathodic protection does is it moves things in this, this direction here where the cathodic current becomes higher than the anodic current here. And when you look at the sum, it's it's a, it's a very low anodic current. You, you can go even further and you can take it almost to zero. Keep in mind that this is a log scale, so even though it looks, they look fairly close, they're orders of magnitude apart. So cathodic protection is simply taking the potential of the iron and making it more cathodic, more negative. And by doing that, we, re, we can reduce this anodic reaction to the point where it's, not, it's, going to, it's either going to re greatly reduce the corrosion rate or, or stop it. Okay, that's enough to technical. Okay, cathodic protection. You've all got cathodic protection systems in your house. Okay, if you have a hot water heater, you've got a cathodic protection system. Um, hot water heaters have CP, cathodic protection anodes. Underground storage tanks, all your gas stations have cathodic protection required by law now to uh, protect the, the uh, uh, storage tanks of gasoline from leaking. Uh, pipelines, bridges now, um, lots of lots of places. Uh, here we go. Here's here's what that anode looks like. Okay, here's one that needs to be replaced in your hot water heater. <coughs> So in a way, you're all cathodic protection specialists. In reinforced concrete, here we have the concrete and the rebar, and we need something, a sacrificial metal, to protect the rebar. So we spray something on the outside of the concrete that makes for good uniform current distribution through all the rebar. This anode, this sprayed on anode is zinc. It's zinc, and that's what's been used here in Oregon. 
primarily. Um, there are a couple, two ways of doing it. One is called impressed current, where you have a rectifier. A rectifier is just simply a power supply that controls how much of this corrodes and how much of this is protected. You have galvanic, which is what you have, basically when you have galvanized screws and galvanized door frames or whatever, where the anode is just simply connected to the rebar and it goes at whatever rate it goes at. You know, it's not controllable. Much cheaper though, it's much cheaper. In Florida, they do this pretty much on, on all their bridges, galvanic. In Oregon, ODOT has decided to go this way. It's more expensive, um, harder to maintain, but easier to control. So, some trade-offs. But ODOT has decided to go with the impressed current cathodic protection. And this is what you see on all the, all the bridges. Uh, and here we have um, arc, thermal arc spraying of zinc, which basically is two wires of zinc coming together through a motorized beater and shorting together. There's a uh, low voltage, high current that causes them to form an arc and uh, they melt and then you blow air and it propels it onto the, uh, onto the bridge. Here you see a, um, a worker doing that. You may notice he's wearing an uh, environmental suit. Zinc fumes are something that you really don't want to breathe. I think someone once told me that um, if you ever see a welder who's cut galvanized pipes and he starts acting a little loopy, then you know why, because zinc does have an effect on on, on uh, humans. But anyway, once it's on the bridge, it's, it's just fine. So here we are, um, and me, Steve Kramer, Gordon Holcomb, out here inspecting the first thermal spray anodic cathodic protection system on the Richmond Red San Rafael Bridge. This is the very first in the country, in the world, I believe. Um, it was done in 1981, and Caltrans was the one who, who did that. And you know, it was this and other people who have done it that led ODOT to come up with a plan to use that here in Oregon you know, to help protect and extend the life of bridges here on the Oregon coast. Uh, so I'm here standing on a boat out in the middle of the bay. Um, it was pretty exciting work. We tied the ladder to the, to the pier and uh, climbed up it. Oh, wow. Well, back in the lab, we had another a similar system, an arc spray. You can see the arc down here. You know, it's very bright, and, and if you looked at it, you'd go blind. So we, we had to wear these uh, welders, masks, welders goggles. Uh, but we used that to, uh, to uh, spray small pieces of concrete that we could use to help study this cathodic protection process. And uh, not a whole lot was known about it at the time that we, uh, we, did, we started doing this. And this is work with ODOT. Uh, ODOT co-funded this work with us. And uh, for example, one of the things that ODOT did on the Aquinnah Bay Bridge is the, there was a paper that said that if, you, if the concrete is heated, the zinc will stick better to it. Okay, that made sense. So they heated every square inch of the of the bridge and then sprayed zinc on it. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit later. I'll tell you why that was not necessary. Um, they also sprayed 20 mils of zinc onto it, 20 thousandths of an inch. We later learned that that was wasteful. That you didn't need that much. So now I'll tell you. I'll show you why that that is. Um, real soon. So these are the slabs that we paint. We uh, spray zinc on, some with zinc, some without zinc. We're running current through there. We're uh, accelerating everything by about a factor of five because you can't wait 25 years to, do, to find out what happened to 25 years. <laughs> but if you can accelerate it in five uh, and, and get your results in five years, then that, that makes sense. 
But, but along the way, you have to check to make sure that your acceleration didn't hurt things. And, and we did that. We compared things that we got here to things that were happening on the bridge, and we found out that, yes, we were good. Yeah, accelerating it did not hurt it. So we were able to do a study of thermal spray zinc on concrete uh, and get 25 to 30 years of results in five years. So w one of the things we found is that the thing that determines the service life of one of, the, of these cathodic protection systems is anode adhesion. And how well does the zinc stick to the uh, concrete? And you may have seen, you may have gone like to the south approach of the uh, Yukon Bay Bridge down by the uh, jetty there and seen patches of zinc falling off. That did happen. Um, and that's the real thing that we found out that that's the thing that limits the life of these systems, not the amount of zinc that you have there. The amount of zinc that you consume of that 20 mils is only about five mils, five thousandths of an inch in 25 years. So, it, yeah. So we were able to uh, um, tell them to reduce the zinc. We said 10 mils. Go with 10 mils and be on the safe side. You know, you still have five in the buffer. And they said 12. Okay, so that. You know, so they, but they did reduce it by, you know, eight mils, eight thousandths of an inch less zinc. That's quite a bit of zinc. Here we are studying the adhesion on the Quinnipiac Bridge, the adhesion of the zinc. And the way we do that is we take these little aluminum pucks, we call dollies, and epoxy them to the uh, to the zinc. And then we have this machine that you you crank it and it ultimately pulls it off. And it gives you the uh, bond strength of the of the of the zinc. And here's what we found. This is the uh, there's a lot of information on this graph, but um, if you can see, let's just look at the what we call wetted. Now wetted means that we applied water to it as you would get on a real bridge. Okay. And it turns out that that's very important because you can see the unwetted fail very quickly. And um, okay, let me let me tell you this x-axis is charge or amount of current that was flowed through the, uh, uh, the the zinc and the rebar, and we've taken that charge and, and uh, converted it to a time years based on the current density that Oregon DOT uses, 2.2 milliamps per square meter. That's the current density on the bridge. So at 2.2 milliamps per square meter, per square meter um, 0, 10, 20, 30 years of service life. So with the wetted, we found a lifespan where the bond strength ultimately went to zero at about 25, 26 years. And I believe ODOT is finding that to be very close to the fact, to the real real life uh, on these bridges. Um, over here, it's a little hard to see these, these little dips, this dip here, this dip here. The solid line is preheated. No, wait a minute. Yeah, the solid line is preheated, and the uh, uh, um, the dotted line is unheated. Um, basically, what it's showing is that initially there was a difference in there was a difference in bond strength. I'm sorry, the dotted line was heated, and the, and the solid line was uh, uh, unheated. There was a, there was a large difference in bond strength. This is bond strength in megapascal. There was a large difference in bond strength between the heated and the unheated initially. But as time progressed and the reactions occurred, they became the same. So there was no there was essentially no difference between whether you heated the concrete or not. So that saved Oregon DOT and the people of Oregon lots of money. This was and this is what what it looks like when when it fails. You, you get a reaction of the zinc 
you form zinc oxides, hydroxides, etc. that deposit on the surface, diffuse into the metal, I mean into the concrete, and and then ultimately build up and break the bond. You can see the bond, you can see the delamination of the zinc occurring here. In fact, we, we ripped the whole, the whole piece of zinc off of this section right here. And that's what's, what's happening on the bridges. This is a, uh, a SEM, scanning electron microscopic protection. And yeah, for a bridge like, uh, how much, how much, uh, how much current? current? Yeah, what, what's the cost? Oh, it's, it's a good amount, yeah. But it's a cost that's worth paying. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I don't know the, the total. A million dollars a year? Oh, I, I don't think so. The uh, zinc uh, coating, mm -hmm. uh, can it withstand tensile forces and lane cracking, cracking? The, the zinc itself? Yes, on the outer surface, you get tension. Will you uh, develop cracks? Uh, no, no. It's a, um, it's called a splat coating. So it's like you would take mud balls and throw them up against the wall, and one on top of the other, and then they would build up, and they build out. It's uh, melted drops of zinc hitting the uh, the concrete, being blown and hit, hitting the concrete. So there, there's, um, it's not totally not porous. So there, there's room for stresses to. Uh, to be uh, removed or, or, you know, where it, it doesn't really, uh, I've never seen that happen, to tell you the truth. New bridges. So what, what can you do with new bridges? Well, our idea is to use stainless steel rebar for the most corrosive microenvironments. And they could also install CP at the time of construction and <coughs> operate it at a lower current density. Um, that's not, that's done a lot in, in Italy, but not too much in the United States. Um, use of stainless steel rebar, I think, makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to tell you why. And, and you have a question about that. I have. About the cost. Because it's a cost between right. regular rebar and stainless steel. So why would you use stainless steel rebar? OK, here's some ideas. Remember the uh, diagram I showed you where the salt was penetrating the concrete, and I told you there was a threshold level of about 1.2, 1.4 pounds of salt per cubic yard for bare steel. Well, for stainless steel, you got to get up to 9 or 19 even. For 316, this is a higher alloy. This is an iron chrome nickel steel, steel high nickel, uh, 19 pounds. So if, if you have stainless steel in the bridge, it's going to take a lot more salt to get to the rebar before it's going to start corroding. And then even if it does start corroding, here you have bare steel, 1.4 mils per year, and I, I told you that even one, one mil of corrosion is going to crack the concrete. So, you know, if you let it go for one year at this, you're going to crack the concrete. Um, but with stainless steel, you're looking at three orders of magnitude lower corrosion range. So, we think that with stainless steel, you get two or three times longer <coughs> service life for the bridge than you do with bare steel, black steel, rebar. And here's the answer to your question. Okay, they did put stainless steel rebar in the Brush Creek Bridge. Now, this was one of the most corrosive environments on the Oregon coast, Brush Creek Bridge. It's what we call microenvironments. You know, there are many different microenvironments along the Oregon coast, and this happens to be one of the most corrosive. So they, they did put uh, a layer of stainless steel closest to the uh, bridge deck, um, in the Brush Creek Bridge. And here's what it's estimated would cost. A 10% cost penalty for using stainless steel rebar. That's 10% of the total cost of the bridge. So. If you think of a $50 million bridge, you're looking at $5 million for um, using stainless steel rebar. That may have gone up now. This has been a while since we've, we've talked about this. But for $5 million, instead of a 50-year bridge, you might get a 100 or 150-year bridge. Uh, to me, that makes an awful lot more sense that we can 
give our children and grandchildren a bridge that they won't have to worry about in their lifetimes, most likely. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so uh, that's basically what we think is the best way to go with the stainless steel rebar when the order goes, when, when they have to build new bridges. Um, now, the Alcee Bay Bridge, what did they do there? They used uh, epoxy coated rebar, which usually I'm not a big fan of because unless, uh, it, it has that insulator, you know, it's like wire, it has a rubber or epoxy insulator around it. If you try to do cathodic protection, you gotta, you're going to have a hard time. Um, but they did use some new modern types of concrete with um, different types of fillers, things that make it much more difficult for the chloride ion to, to migrate in. So time will tell. We'll see. <laughs> Some of you might see. <laughs> I don't think I'll see. And the beautiful road we were red. Okay. Just do we have time or should I stop here? We got maybe uh, Ten slides or so on the uh, corrosion of metals. Well, seventeen, I like. So we did a study of corrosion of metals all up and down the Oregon coast, and it was a it was a really a, a tough research project. We had to. <laughs> come to the Oregon coast and drive all along the coast and <laughs> eat seafood and uh, <laughs> but somebody had to do it so we won't do it. That's terrible. Really terrible. Terrible. <laughs> Here we are uh, after a day's work at the Old Elbow State Park. Our guys, we, we, we had a good time. We, we, we did a lot of good work though. But so atmospheric corrosion, um, it's just like what I, I mentioned in previously. You have a nodic reaction, you have a cathodic reaction, but um, and you have what we call wet deposition, rain, fog. But there's also dry deposition now. You're sitting, you've got these uh, metals sitting out, and they got dust from truck, you know, mist from trucks and uh, agricultural. Uh, Compounds and uh, industrial pollutants uh, landing on the stones into into the uh, corrosion. Uh, here we had our, our site where we studied uh, in, in Newport, and it's similar to the one we had in Albany. And here we have our metals, and here we have what we call our runoff, where we collected every bit of uh, rainwater that hit this surface here into these jugs. We would come back periodically and pick up these jugs. We'd take them to the, our analytical chemists and they would tell us what's in, what, what ran off, what, um, and then at some point later we would analyze the metal and find out what's stuck there. Um, and it's actually these kinds of things that Oregon DOT uses near um, bridge spraying sites where they're spraying zinc. They use something like this to monitor how well they're doing in keeping the zinc contained in their containment devices. <clears throat> anyway, this is, um, these are various things, ammonium, ion, sulfate, nitrate, salt, calcium, magnesium, these are the things we found on on the, on the runoff, in the runoff, from the dry deposition. And we, we compared what we found in Albany, which is, you know, very far inland, to what we found here in, in or up north in Newport. And uh, as you can see, probably, in the, except for, you know, you have this great difference, factor of 10 difference in the scale here. So I think you're, yeah. I think you're seeing very similar things yeah. for these things, for these elements here, um, but not for sodium and not for chlorine. 
salt, yeah. the sodium chloride. So, for you know, uh, order of magnitude higher uh, in Newport compared to Albany. And these are all the places that we we did uh, uh, did our work from Astoria down to Berkeley. The bridges, Young's Bay Bridge, Depot, Bay Bridge, Equina, Humphrey River Bridge, Brush Creek Bridge, Rogue River Bridge. That's where we, we had samples hung from the bridges. And then in these cities, <coughs> Manzanita, Lincoln City, Newport, Reachport, Cape Blanco, Gold Beach, Brookings. Um, here we had um, samples mounted to telephone poles at a distance of uh, very close to the ocean to five miles or so uh, east of the ocean. Cape Blanco, we thought that would be a great challenge because of the great winds that they have there, but we were able to uh, keep our, uh, our sample racks on the poles there. Actually, the biggest problem we had were utility workers who would uh, occasionally take down our sample racks and throw them away. And not tell us. So that was a bit frustrating. And then we had three in the site, Portland, Albany, and Grants Pass. Anyway, here's here we are mounting one to on highway twenty in uh, Newport to to a uh, utility pole. That was one of the ways that we uh, we mounted our samples. Oops, too far. Here we are uh, hanging off the uh, the bridge. Um, I think it's Uquina Bay Bridge. Yes. Um, here you see our samples. We had different. Uh, we had basically we had steel that was bare steel that was coated with the kind of paint system that ODOT uses on their bridges, and then steel that was coated with something novel, uh, thermal spray aluminum coating on this steel. That's what you see, you see here. And we had sample racks mounted up underneath the bridges. We call them shelter because they, they don't get washed by rain. Uh, the mists and the fogs deposit on them and sit on them and dry on them and, and they, they never get washed. Probably the most, the worst place to be for the metal is underneath a shelter, in a sheltered environment. These are the kind, some of the results that we got. Grams Pass, this is mass loss, grams of iron per, per square meter in time, years, so over about a two year period. Portland, Albany, Grants Pass, Portland, more corrosive, don't want to live in Portland. <laughs> Here, here's, I think, one of the more interesting graphs. So again, mass loss in grams, distance to the ocean in meters, and you can see the, uh, the uh, mass loss decreases to very close to zero at about 7,500 meters about five miles. So um, you can see that if you're living within 100 meters or so, you're going to have iron going to corrode pretty readily, unless you protect it somehow. And then or orientation. We looked at orientation. So we looked at uh, zero degrees, and we looked at uh, 30 degrees to the horizontal, and then we looked at 90 degrees. And you can see, as you would expect, zero degrees was at least at Brush Creek. And here you can see the difference between the environment. Young Bay is just outside of uh, Astoria, Young Bay Bridge, and uh, Brush Creek, much higher corrosion rate than, than the, the flat like this, where, where stuff can deposit and sit on the surface and, and not get washed off as easily. Birds can sit on it. We put these we put these spikes on them thing to, to prevent the birds from <laughs> roost nesting on it. It worked pretty good. Here's a what Oregon 
DOT uses the three coat bridge maintenance paint system and three different uh, types of paint. They apply to the metal parts of the bridges now, not, not the concrete, the metal parts of the bridges. And here's something that we were researching, thermal sprayed aluminum, and then we sealed that with a, an epoxy top coat. And before we exposed them, we scribed with a diamond scribe, we scored the surface down to the bare metal. Because what we want to look at is the attack from the outside when you get a, um, you know, maybe a stone hits the metal and chips away the paint. What's going to happen? That's what we were trying to simulate. And uh, at uh, Uquina Bay, here you can see 30, 90, 30, 90, not a whole lot of difference. It's really tore up the, uh, the paint system. But the uh, thermal spray aluminum looks pretty good. Pretty good some spots and stuff on the outside of it, but it, uh, not a whole lot of penetration in, in the scored lines here. After how much time is that? This was after uh, two years. Okay. Um, and here, um, Skyward Paint, I did a function. Okay, so we have the painted skywood and groundwork, and we have the thermal spray aluminum here. Um, undercutting, undercutting of the coating in millimeters, so we can measure how far under the coating did corrosion attack, and distance to the ocean in meters. And you can see, first of all, the thermal spray was pretty uniform and very low compared to the paint. With, with these paint samples, we were able to look at samples. We exposed some samples that were uh, facing skyward and we taped off the back. And some, we had them facing groundward and we taped off the top so that we could look at the individual effects of the two different forms of exposure. Uh, skyward, of course, facing skyward, the paint sample tore it up. Facing groundward, still tore it up but not as bad as the uh, Skyward. <laughs> and when we finished, we, we, <coughs> we were so happy. Done at last. There's me and Steve Kramer and Sophie Bullard and this is Steve Mathis. And that's all I have. And I, I really thank you all for your attention. And I'm, I'm be happy to answer any, any other questions that you might have. Yes. When they tore down the Alcee Bay Bridge, they blew it up and then they let it fall in the water and they had to come back and pick it up again. Was that yes. to keep the zinc out or what? Uh, there was no zinc on it. Oh. Well, that, that was never, that was before ODOT um, developed the strategy to use thermal spray zinc. Um, well, why did they have to clean up the stuff? I think it, it, it was just uh, a a hazard to uh, navigation, I think. Oh. You know, all those people crabbing down there. Well, <laughs> I'd love to go crabbing there. Up there. You no know, longer can do anything about the uh, excavating the bottom in the house and bed. They stopped doing that. So the bottom of it is still there. Still there? Still there, yeah. Silting, sort of tilt in. Oh, okay. But since they don't, they have to have to try to do that in the uh -huh. So they left some of it there? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, you're not very worried about making a very much draft for the people around. Uh huh. Okay. Yes, sir. You mentioned the aligned steel, but how about concrete? Is that there just been any uh, change in the properties of concrete to either make it stronger or less on it? Well, yeah, there's been there. There's tons of research that, that has been done on concrete. I'm not a concrete chemist. Um, I do know some people who are, and they have they have looked at different compositions, formulations for concrete. But primarily, it's the additives that they add. They add things like called pozzolans, and uh, um, you know they're adding all sorts of different things that that not only make it stronger. But make it more less porous. Yes. With your new techniques, and a bridge can last 
say, tw two or three times longer than presently. How, what happens at the end of that time? Do you have to rebuild the whole bridge, or do you start resurfacing again? With with uh, this cathodic protection, um, actually, you know, ODOT has um, the question was what happens when the zinc starts uh, failing. Um, ODOT has conducted several uh, research projects that I've been part of as an, an advisory uh, function. But uh, how do you take the zinc off? How much of the concrete do you have to take off? Remember I showed you the graph that showed you the zinc was going into the concrete? you got to get that out of there. So you're going to have to um, probably blast it with something. But you don't want to blast it too much because then you start um, exposing too much aggregate. And if you have too much aggregate, then the bond strength isn't there. So ODOT, I think, has that figured out. And uh, I, think, I think, you know, they're, they're doing a good job. I guess the alternative would be to tear down and build a new bridge, but the people of Oregon, I believe, have spoken that we do not want to lose these historic bridges. Well, thank you very much.